Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Gay With God podcast, a safe place for us to share our stories and support one another. How long did we know? What challenges did we face? Did we lose our faith? When did we find our way back home? Or are we still searching? The stories you hear on this podcast will melt your heart and strengthen your belief that in God, all things are possible, and you can be, authentically, gay with the God of your understanding. I am your host, Midge Noble, and I am very honored that you are here. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Gay With God podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. And as always, I love how you are sharing and subscribing and downloading this podcast and making us more visible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Today, I have a wonderful guest, a new friend that I met at the Wild Goose Festival. I know I've mentioned this festival before, so please Google this thing because this may just be the right ticket for you to go and have a wonderful, beloved community surround you as you're getting to to just experience the the beauty of what heaven might be like because the diversity is amazing and the welcoming and the loving is amazing so uh the wild goose festival is where we pick up amazing people <laughs> like my guest today whose name is greg walton he is a dynamic christian musician and speaker with a mission to foster the love of christ through prayer word song and above all belonging Greg's mission, which began with participation in his vibrant church choir and soon grew into writing contemporary Christian music at age 15, has provided many unique opportunities to share his message of love. He earned his bachelor's in music education at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and went on to teach and direct music in the Chicago area. During that time, Greg performed his music locally until he caught the interest of national industry professionals. After landing an artist development deal, he moved his young family to Tennessee from the late 90s to early 2000s. He toured full-time as keyboard player for the Dove Award-nominated band Polar Boy. As a token Catholic performing in mainstream Christian music, Greg found himself playing everywhere but the Catholic Church. He left Polar Boy to focus on accompanying young Catholics. In 2005, he began composing contemporary liturgical music for OCP's Spirit and Song Division, beginning with his songs, King of My Heart and We Are His People, while leading retreats and programs for the young church. This work has taken him all over North America, Europe, Africa, and includes two World Youth Days. Greg's independent modern rock alternative projects have received a total of 10 Unity Awards from the United Catholic Music and Video Association. Greg's motto, go where love leads. I love that. Go where love leads is especially evident in the 2020 OCP release, Eyes on the Cross. He resides in Spring Hill, Tennessee with his wife and college sweetheart, Mary, where they do their best to keep up with their kiddos. In addition to composing, Greg serves as the Electronic Evangelization Coordinator at St. Philip Catholic Church, Franklin, and leads worship at Church of the Nativity, Thompson Station. You're a very busy guy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well welcome yeah. to the show greg welcome to the show oh mitch it's so good to be here yeah um <laughs> and, and i need to get in there uh, you know lgbtq advocacy you know and mm-hmm. and uh as mm-hmm. well I, I was just thinking about that i'm like oh man i, I need to get that in my bio i have it in my <laughs> blogs and I just well, haven't gotten to it. Well, that's fine. And today we'll get to it because, you know, as, as talented as, and as awesome as you are, and I would want you as my guest anyway, the whole reason we connected at the Wild Goose is that you came to my podcast, uh, mm-hmm. the live taping, and we had a conversation after, and you were sharing about your, your kids, and you were talking about how the podcast is relevant to your family life and to your support of our community. And I was like, I need you on my show. <laughs> <laughs> And I just thought it was brilliant that we were able to have that connection. And so tell us your story as, as a, as a dad to your kiddos, what's relevant about my gay with God podcast and your experience. Yeah. So I have, well, two of my kids are LGBTQ, you Mm -hmm. know, and um, that really opened our world. Um, We came from uh, a very kind of traditionally Catholic 
thinking um, family. Uh, and we homeschooled our kids in part so that we could go out on the road, but then also because we wanted to ensure they got like an individualized Catholic mm -hmm. education and, mm -hmm. and all that. You know, it's, it's funny because the first kiddo to come out um, is Evie, our middle and Evie is trans femme. So that's a signed male at birth and identifies and displays generally feminine, you mm -hmm. know, that's different from being a, a transgender woman, you mm -hmm. know, you know, but think of it, as, you know, there's the um, non-binary, which is identifying in between male, female, trans femme would kind of be in between that and transgender, you know? Okay. So, um, and then our oldest kiddo, Jesse is pansexual and non-binary. Um, and Jesse came out after, after college. So accompanying Evie, it, it kind of was a crash course in mm -hmm. all things LGBTQ. Uh, at first we, we didn't do our, the best job. I mean, we, I did tell, you know, Evie, I love you, you know, mm -hmm. and there is nothing that's going to change that love. You know, I want you to know that. Um, but their resentment, I think with our conservative parenting, um, and other things was, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, I, I got, mm -hmm. we got a healing road. We got to dive mm -hmm. into. Um, and so, uh, uh, I just, uh, followed Evie's lead, you know, on, on the support that she needed. Um, she started attending an LGBTQ youth support group in Nashville at the Nashville Oasis Center, mm -hmm. which is a really amazing comprehensive community center um, with, you know, integrated with the Boys and Girls Club and everything else. And uh, they, at that time, they were doing a, a camp called Camp Anytown, where they would bring kids from all different demographics, you know, wow. uh, racially, socioeconomically, and, uh, and, uh, in terms of LGBTQ inclusion too, and basically make the brex breakfast club happen over a weekend. You know? <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, but what it also did is, is um, it really opened my eyes to, I think the real narratives versus the bubble narratives I had been mm -hmm. in as a conservative Catholic parent, you know, mm -hmm. um, what I was being told were, you know, the issue, the issue was, versus what it, it really was. And um, as I came to understand the, um, the links with uh, LGBTQ youth suicidality, mm -hmm. the number one being, you know, um, how parents, you know, whether or not parents accept their kids, mm -hmm. and the second being trying to reconcile religion, you know, mm -hmm. with their givens, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and it also introduced me to the research behind it that this is not it's not a phase it's not um uh it's you know it it's it's based you know as as i said as a given in somebody's life it's not something mm -hmm. that's gonna it's, it goes away mm -hmm. and um and all those things so i got educated you know and uh mary and i slowly moved into advocacy and as you mentioned, I spend a lot of time out on the road and I know a lot of, you know, um, key Catholic ministry leaders who actually are, are open and accepting, um, but they have no idea of the vocabulary. They don't know what LGBTQIA plus, you know, mm -hmm. means. Uh, and so they kept on saying, ask me a lot of questions. And uh, I was sharing with them about a concept that, that some of my other fellow parents have called the, the parent closet. You know, whereas as your kids come out, especially if you're a person of faith, yeah. the parents go into a closet because you you don't know if there's a safe space in the community. And that was really mind blowing to them mm -hmm. that there was this tension for families, you know, and for yeah. the kids. Uh, and so they wanted to do something about it. So they kept on saying to me, Greg, you should give a talk on this. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. <laughs> you do it. You should give a talk on this. And um and so uh, I was encouraged. Uh, we have a big, I guess, I guess, faith formation conference in California every year called the, by the Archdiocese of Los Angeles called the Religious Education Congress. It's held at the Anaheim Convention Center. And pre-COVID, we had as many as 40,000 people come through oh. it. Wow. It's international. Wow. I mean, we're, we, we draw from the Pacific Islands, from the UK, Canada, Mexico, 
all over the world. Wow. Um, the Pope does a specific address just for our conference, you know. Um, uh, and uh, and so I I pitched, you know, a workshop accompanying LGBTQ youth and their families and um, uh, and prepped a, a talk, you know, and I integrated some video clips of um, some kiddos that have been displaced, you yeah. know, LGBTQ mm -hmm. kiddos that have been displaced and lived with us and their experience coming out to their family mm. and what their impression or experience was with religion, you know, mm. and wove those into the presentation. And, um, mm. and it went really, really well. And it was well received that they invited me back in 2022 to do um, uh, how to make parish ministry work. So that's kind of my, you know, my story. And, and uh, what's funny, <laughs> yeah, human sexuality seems to have been a theme in my life for whatever reason. I, my, when I first started playing my songs publicly, I was, uh, it was with a, a group called Teens Living Chastity, which was mm -hmm. based out of Elmhurst, Illinois. Um, and we were uh, a Catholic based group. And we basically talked about the positive aspects of abstinence in public schools, as well as in, you know, for religious institutions. And my part was sharing when we were in a church context was sharing my faith. And I was the token guy virgin in the in the group, you know, uh, chastity and the church's teaching and sexual ethics were something that were very important to me. And so my kids heard that, you know, mm -hmm. as well, you know, um, I don't, I wasn't hateful. I didn't use slurs. Um, but I think, uh, it was just, um, still told my kids there wasn't a place for them. Yeah. You know, that, maybe it was this a, may not be a safe place. May not be a safe place. Maybe it was mm -hmm. a groan, you know, with a mm -hmm. scene that was a, a same sex kiss, you know, on a mm -hmm. on a show or or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I encourage parents to to do the opposite, you know, right? It, it to to because of the risk of children, you know, um, and to make it easier for them to come out. You know, one mistake I made with Evie is I approached Evie. Evie was outed by one of their siblings you know? Mm. And, and so I, I went and talked to Evie about it, but something that Evie said to me, she goes, you, I get that your intention was good, but you took the power away from me because uh. there's so much that we feel is powerless in our lives already. Uh. Having that power to come out when, and if we want to is key. And so, um, but there's other ways I think we can, we can send a, a positive code, you know, where if there is a scene on television to say, you know, if any of your friends, you know, are out, I want you to know this is a safe place for them. Mm -hmm. But that also says to your kid, this is a safe place for you in the event. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. But you know, how did you get to that place? How did you get to that place of wanting to be that safe place? I know you talked about researching and everything, but yeah. how could you have known back in the day that you would want to give that safe place? message because you were still wrapped up in in your teachings and what had been taught to you so so when you are talking to parents you know they're in that space too of unknowingness you know yeah. Maya Angelou says when we know better we do better well that's great but before we know better <laughs> it takes people like you Greg to go out and enlighten people before they mess up <laughs> I think part of it too is being on the national circuit mm -hmm. um internationally even doing ministry mm -hmm. i saw the places that were doing really good ministry made it a generous space you know mm -hmm. and and didn't really try to dictate too much on the you know when it came to 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 sexual ethics but focused mm -hmm. on on justice and belonging mm -hmm. and giving a place to pray you know mm -hmm. and I dialogued with um, one of one of the leaders at at the Oasis Center. And, um, you mentioned that I went to Africa. I've mm -hmm. been to Ghana, Africa, with Catholic Relief Services, mm -hmm. and, and viewing, you know, just to so that I could go and talk about their work, you know, when I mm -hmm. do my programs. One of the things that impressed me when I got back at the community center, there was uh, one of the leaders, LGBTQ leaders, there at the Oasis Center that Evie was going to actually was on mission with a bunch of nuns in Ghana. Wow. And we talked about this, you know, this common thread. And also I had witnessed a lot of 
amazing LGBTQ people working in the church quietly on a don't ask, don't tell level. But I, and I witnessed that, that tension, you mm -hmm. know, they, that space that they live in, but at the same time, the immense love and even how their relationships with their partner empowered that mission, you know, and supported it. Mm -hmm. So those were realities that helped me help that not, you know, just unravel, mm -hmm. I think. I'm so glad that you're on this earth and I'm glad that you're, that you've evolved because you know, a lot of parents when faced with this lock in and they lock it down and they want to fix it and they want to maybe understand it, but they're not always so attuned to how their evolution in this, their own ability to, to love their kid is covered with the fear of hell. And we've talked about that on the show so often that that message of going to hell surrounding the LGBTQIA community is powerful. And many religious people cannot rectify that. You know, they don't know how to or they're not willing to believe. Or they're in. afraid they're going to go to hell, too. Exactly. If they, yeah. Exactly. It's that mm -hmm. co-joining of I love you, but I can't love that sin and I got to step away from it because, you know, I'm not going down with you kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And even when I tried to educate my family, they called it my my one of my family members called it propaganda. When I was trying to share information, that's propaganda. We only read the Bible. I'm like no mm -hmm. that's not true because you read <laughs> you read the little devotionals from your church and somebody else has told you what that says that's not necessarily the bible but it's like somebody else's viewpoint and this is somebody but i couldn't sell it i could not sell it <laughs> mm -hmm. but you're right I, it, it's it's their belief as well that not only would we be going to hell as far as a community member but that they would go to hell by saying we accept you or that we we accept your your belovedness in Christ and your gayness at the same time. Mm -hmm. They just can't get past that right. fear. So right. I, I applaud you, yeah. Greg, that you, Thanks. that you were able to take that step because how scary that must've been for you. And how did that affect your internal family? As far as like people who are closest to you in your family and in your church, did you have to go into the parent closet for a little bit? Oh gosh. Um, I, I don't do closets well. I'm kind of a nonconformist. Um, so, no, uh, but when it was in terms of church, it was a little easier because at the time that Evie came out, our first kiddo mm -hmm. um, was uh, to, to be out. I mean, I was teaching in a public school, right? And so there was not really, I didn't have to worry about an institutional stigma there. Um, and then I was able to dialogue actually with, with other key, you know, with some leaders who had, I guess, had already been on the journey a while mm -hmm. in ministry, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Um, I was really grateful that one of my friends in ministry, under, when they got a feel that I was, I wouldn't freak out, came out to me who, you know, mm -hmm. was actually um, working with, with Catholic Relief Services at the time, you know, and, um, and shared their heart with me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and those types of, of, of accompaniment, you know, really, really helped. There was also an experience I've come to look at as just the reality for LGBTQ folks, for many, especially in rural America, um, that I had in high school and that I think did also impact and maybe give me an inkling of sensitivity for the LGBTQ community in general and mm -hmm. also being in the arts. I mean, I've had a lot mm -hmm. of folks mm -hmm. and friends. But um, when I was 15, uh, we would vacation regularly out in northern Indiana, um, mm -hmm. my family, um, at a little cottage on a lake. And in that town, there was a small Catholic church, and they would host a, a big festival. Um, and the whole town would come out to it. You know, it was the, you know, the bouncy houses and some carnival <laughs> games, Knights of Columbus, beer tent, you know, barbecue. And they had, um, they had a dance for the teens. And so I decided I was going to go out to the dance. I'm, I was, I'm from the Southwest suburbs of Chicago. So this was 1985. So I dressed how I would go into a party with my friends. I put a little extra gel in my hair. I had an oversized suit coat. I wore, I was ready for the night. I went to the dance. It was walking distance from where we stayed. So I walked to the church and, and um, nobody really was dancing and I, I knew how to dance. And so 
Um, and I asked a girl to dance and we danced for a little bit and I hung out with some people afterwards. And as I was walking home, I was followed by three kids. One of them caught up to me, pinned me to the ground mm. and put a knife to my throat. Oh my goodness. And said, you're obviously gay. So tell me why I shouldn't slit your throat right now. <gasps> oh my God. Yeah. So I was already, I mean, at this point I was a person of faith. I'd had an encounter, you know, where I think of Ephesians 3.18, I was grasping how long and wide and high and deep is that love of Christ, you know? Mm. And um, and so I decided to share my faith with this kid, you know? And um, also, I have to admit that I was hoping that um, bringing Jesus in the conversation <laughs> would impact his moral compass. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Shake him up a little bit. Never, never a bad idea to invite <laughs> Jesus to the party. <laughs> So I invited Jesus to the party. There you go. We had, yeah. And uh, he, he let me up. He's like, so, so you're a Christian? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, get out of here. So, you know, here's this, a few things I break. You know, oh, and then when I got home, you know, I, I shared what happened with my parents. Uh -huh. And my parents who were generally, you know, really loving parents, but they said, well, that's your fault wearing what you wore to that dance. Oh, you know? Oh my gosh. So here is... I think a little microcosm of the LGBTQ experience uh -huh. in the context uh -huh. of religion, where in the community of faith, we don't really realize how people are being treated in the shadows uh -huh. and how our kids are reacting uh -huh. based on the rhetoric they hear at home, uh -huh. you know? And then also we don't, we're ignorant to how parents are reacting to their kids and uh -huh. the impact that has on them when they're just trying uh -huh. to be their authentic selves. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, if we took it off topic for a second, that's the same thing that women go through by being blamed for what you wore is why you got raped. And so, mm -hmm. you know, gay people, I mean, you can have heterosexual people holding hands as friends and as long as they don't look gay or, you know, they, it's not a big deal, but gay people have a, that fear of holding hands in public because if they, they might have that violence brought back to them um, because they may look a little bit more masculine walking down the street. And, you know, if you've got two cheerleading friends, you know, with their little pom pom heads and, you know, that's fine, but don't let us do it, you know, because then mm -hmm. that could be a problem. That is, yeah. that is crazy that your parents, <laughs> that that was their comeback. That's, that's wild that they would say that. Yeah. And, and so that's what we're kind of, that's what's happening, yeah. you know? Well, I'm just glad you survived it. And I'm glad you brought Jesus to the party. And I'm glad that <laughs> I did. I brought Jesus to the party yeah. and uh, yeah. we got, I got through it. And um, wow. so, yeah, wow. <laughs> when I do, so when I do presentations on inclusion to youth, uh -huh. I actually start with that story. That's a good one. Yeah. When I look at my calling to this, this ministry, I didn't see it at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd have to say my mission started, you know, when my kids came out. But God started prepping me mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. with that experience. It yeah, formed yeah. me. So how did that then change you as far as how you presented yourself to the world? Did that have anything to do with your decisions later about how to dress or, or whether or not when they thought you were gay, did that ever shake your own compass as to who you are as a person? Well, that's the thing is that these, these very um, dualistic ideas of masculinity and femininity actually i think perpetuate the cycle mm -hmm. of, of of violence mm -hmm. you know which is generally perpetrated by heterosexual men mm -hmm. you know um even sexual violence you know majority are heterosexual men against mm -hmm. men and women mm -hmm. you know because it's it's about power or control or, yes. or threat or whatever right mm -hmm. and so i'd have to say that what it has done and uh, is well, it's brought me to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, doing and uh, uh, working through that, but it, it's made me, you know, uh, a little bit leery about in, when it comes to male relationships mm -hmm. and and, and f being able to feel at ease. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't really change the way that I I presented myself um, t too much, um, but. I probably did. I got to probably admit there probably was some code switching, mm -hmm. you know, when I would go into places, you mm -hmm. know, it was like, that was a, a moment to me like, ah, okay. 
I got to look a certain way. I got to talk a certain way here Mm -hmm. and, you know, versus there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, that was so traumatic. I mean, it it had to have had an imprint, you know, because that, that kind of trauma, I mean, that was just shocking and scary and could have been deadly. Mm -hmm. So did your parents ever then question who was it or <laughs> were they only concerned about your clothing? No, the, Did they ever follow up There was no effort to violence? try to press charges no, or really? do a police report or anything. Mm. No. Mm. Stay quiet. You, you brought this on yourself. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that. Because that <laughs> no. is so – no, no I, we won't do therapy. I didn't okay, mean for this to take the whole, like, <laughs> deal, but – but, no, but really, um, this is so relevant, though, Greg. This is so relevant that your experience as a heterosexual male is now intertwined with the marginalized community, whether it's a black person driving, whether it's the gay people trying to just, you know, hold hands in public. This is something I think our community needs to understand that we are not the only people who are targeted, and that even people who are not normally targeted can get targeted. So, I mean, it's just, it's so relevant to, to our stories as humans right now, you know, how we are, how we are managing the stress of just being on this earth right now and all of the heightened anger and hate that is permeating uh, Mm -hmm. across our nation. We have lost, and I know this happened when you were 15, but it also is a thread that comes forward that we're still not really appreciating each other's independent right to be themselves. You Mm -hmm. know, we're still pigeonholing people. We're still targeting people who are different. And it seems like the fear of being around anybody that's not exactly like us, you know, has perpetuated that problem all the way down through the generations. And I don't know what's going to stop it. (laughs) Right. And, you know, witnessing um, Evie have Mm -hmm. um, her her own experiences coming out in school, Mm -hmm. you know, and especially when she started presenting feminine, which was around her junior, senior year of high school in a, you know, in Murray County, Tennessee, mm-hmm. kids threw condoms at her on the bus and cussed her out in the name of Jesus and told her she was, you know, disgusting. And, you know, all these types of, of things or what is that, you know, kind of mm-hmm. question marks going through. And that's, that's the, uh, the type of, of, abuse that mm-hmm. uh, a lot of our LGBTQ kids are are handling. So, you know, when people get all wound up about what we're about talking about gender identity uh, and sexual orientation mm-hmm. to kids, I guess what I would compare it to is, is it's, it's not that it's going to impact your kids. It's not contagious, <laughs> but it is going to impact how they react when they yeah. experience other Mm-hmm. And and one story that, you know, Jesse, my oldest, this is, you know, um, my NB kiddo, non-binary kiddo. Um, we, when we started, when we, we stopped homeschooling, um, when Jesse was in, in seventh grade and, um, and we ended up sending them to a performing arts school, they and their sister, Sarah, um, and uh, that would, you could opt into and so Jesse's first day there, Jesse brought a bottle of holy water, you know, that they kept in their locker, you know, and the idea was maybe, I thought, oh, they're going to bless themselves in the morning or something like that. <laughs> so they were at their locker and a, uh, another kiddo came in and I think he might have been a, a Green Day fan or something, but he had, you know, eyeliners and all black, black nails. Jesse freaked out, thought the kid was a Satanist, pulled out the holy water bottle and doused him. Oh, no. With holy water. We think we're protecting our kids, but actually we're kind of creating these little monsters that are not going to, you know, uh, love people very well when they mm-hmm. encounter, you know, something that's different. And, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and Jesse looks at that now with, with a lot of regret. You mm-hmm. know, they say, you know, I never, I never saw that kid again. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the community impact mm-hmm. when we don't have dialogue. And so yes. we need to find that balance. Or the kid who like, you know, Evie talks about, they, they knew something was different by, you know, who they were attracted to watching TV as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and then, um, then they found out what gay was in, in, in fifth grade, they felt very alone and there was no, no one saying you're okay. Mm-hmm. 
you're you're okay mm-hmm. you know through all of that in a, in a public education setting right that's you know that there's a lot of risk going behind that mm-hmm. you know and then kids reacting the way that they do mm-hmm. when they encounter that difference mm-hmm. uh, as well and that goes back to the heightened suicidal rate of right. our our kid community because and even in even in adults i mean there are adults that still can't rectify their faith and and their authenticity but you know when you're raised in a strict religious environment with parents that you don't believe are affirming and a school that's rejecting you and bullying you. I mean, the, the coping skills of young kids is incredible. You know, I worked with kids my whole professional career up until this point. And, you know, it's amazing to look at kids in foster care and see what they go through. But, you know, I was often working with kids who were trying to come out at, at the young age of, you know, middle school, high school, and, and yet they were placed in a foster care system and into a foster home with extremely Mm non-affirming, very awful parents, foster parents that made their lives so incredibly difficult that I was forever talking to them about why they shouldn't give up. Mm -hmm. And a disproportionate amount of LGBTQ kids are in foster care. Yes. And are homeless, 40% homeless, you know, 30% are in foster care. And, uh, and of course, you know, if a kid ends up out on their own um, because they're kicked out of the house by a parent as a minor, well, mm-hmm. they're not going to be put back in, but then they're in the foster care system that, mm-hmm. you know, has people not equipped to yep. really accompany them. Yep. I, I just, I have a, a dad that um, I met with earlier this year, you know, who uh, was, wanting to just get some fellowship on accompanying his LGBTQ kid. And then he shared that they had full custody of, a, of another young girl whose parents kicked her out because they found out she had a girlfriend mm-hmm. and they just actually surrendered their parenting rights right over oh. to him. Just, okay, we're, we're done. We don't want them. And then mm. another family just reached out to us to sharing that, you know, they had a displaced kiddo living with them and ended up back with the parents, but the parents call her a destroyer of families. They, mm. you know, um, mm. they won't let her stay with um, her aunt who has, you know, girl cousins as well. Cause they're saying, well, you're going to molest, you're going to molest her. So that also that, that stigma that, that being LGBTQ means you're promiscuous or that, mm-hmm. you know, or, or that, you know, yeah, you know, you're an abuser. We like target, the, yeah, we target yeah. children. Yeah. 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 I, I've said before that, you know, my work in this rural community as a, as a gay woman was, was difficult to do because I worked with children and, you know, I would go behind closed doors to have a session. A lot of times I did a lot of family therapy. And I think part of that was my way of protecting myself professionally. I, I loved family therapy because it really is the the adults that you need to kind of reach in order to help this child. They always identify the child as the person that needs the most, but it is the family. So I always wanted the family involved, especially the parents or the foster parents, so that they could make a link back to the child at home once the session is over. There were times that the kid needed just that privacy to say with whatever they needed to say, not in front of their parents for their protection. But I always took that risk that if anyone ever questioned, you know, what happened in that session and I didn't have anybody else in there. So it's it's so hard on the kids to be able to have that safe space, even when it's sort of provided, it can definitely, you know, be something that someone tries to manipulate and take away. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've gotten some messages too since I've started doing workshops of people saying stop grooming children, you yes. know, yes. You know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You're coaching them to be gay. Yeah. So okay. yeah, so so, you know what? We kind of I kind of got off uh, line. Mm-hmm. So you'd asked me earlier, I guess, what um, how was the reaction with family? Yeah, you know, the extended family for us, and I would say it was a mix. You know, my my parents were good. Um, my wife's parents were cool. Um, we did have, uh, some, um, of family that, you know, uh, we had a family member who is a, uh, very conservative, um, 
involved in in church leadership i'll just say and Mm -hmm. and basically you know told us you know sent me a a long letter with all these footnotes and you know everything it was like a like a term paper deal oh no you know um because they got a phd in from a catholic school you know (laughs) kind of deal and and so um you know saying that uh you know what we're doing is wrong that they could not uh, refer to Evie by, you know, her, her given, you know, her chosen name, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but the bottom line being is that they did not want Evie to present feminine at the family reunion because they were afraid it would impact, you know, their, their kids, you know? Mm. Um, and so, uh, that was really, really, that was really, really tough, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, and it's kind of really, um, <laughs> ruined that gathering you know Mm -hmm. you know for my Mm -hmm. kids they're just not comfortable Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. anymore um and then uh i did you know landed when i started working um in the church full time um uh, i was very upfront with the the pastor and the staff you know you know saying hey i got lgbtq kids you know i said i i don't hold back about this, I'm supporting them. You know, mm-hmm. I'm gonna be at Pride festivals. You know, I'm gonna, you know, and they said, okay, okay. You know, although the pastor said to me, well, Greg, you don't, you have to put your family out in the street, which meaning like, you know, you don't have to have everything on your sleeve. You know, you don't, oh, uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. kind of thing. And uh, but um, uh, you know, when Evie started going to like LGBTQ proms and, and I had some posts, you know, from our, mm-hmm. um, P flag parties or things like that, you know, uh, parents started, you know, um, complaining, you know, and actually, you know, uh, even distorting information, you know, uh, and, you know, to the, to the pastor and, and saying, mm-hmm. well, we're, we're afraid for our kids, you know? <laughs> kind of thing was the initial reaction. And that, wow. that settled down, I think, as um, uh, I built relationships, you know, and um, it's funny because I, I, I uh, gathered with a, a friend leads a home church out in, Cal- out in California. So after I played for mass in the morning, I, I joined their thing and, and it was all about um, uh, living with uh, tension you know, of, 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 uh, disturbance, you know, and the importance of disturbance and mm-hmm. Richard Rohr talks about it, mm. um, as, um, disorder, you know, that, and that disorder is prophetic, you know, in so many ways. And so, um, so I've just kind of learned to, um, be present mm-hmm. in the midst of that disorder and disorder reminds us that we don't know everything that we're in constant dialogue with modern biology and psychology Mm -hmm. and science, you know, um, anthropology. So, um, yeah. So I, I, my, um, staying with the church in, in a way and working is, is kind of an act of defiance saying, okay, I'm a member of the body of Christ. You just have to deal with it, you know, until they say, we don't want you here anymore. And they haven't done that. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's interesting. Seriously, that's very interesting that they've accommodated that somehow in their head, <laughs> however they're framing it. <laughs> I think my my shield, honestly, is being a, a straight, cisgendered, heterosexual uh-huh. guy. So right? you think that if you were actually gay yourself, it, they wouldn't be as happy? I, 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 yeah, I so think you're, so. So you're a Christian dad hanging in there with his kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, wow. if they, if they mm-hmm. start, you know, if they have to dismiss me mm-hmm. over an issue... Mm-hmm. like that then then you know it's gonna scare you know you know seven yeah. percent of our parents you know or 20 yeah. percent of our parents you know yeah to death you know yes yeah. yes because they're a target too yes wow that's so interesting <laughs> so you were the man you were the man that needed to have this mission and it got planted back in your early years <laughs> That's that's incredible. And I love that you brought in Richard Rohr. I love Richard Rohr and he's he's got such great insights. And and I agree that disorder 
you know, when we think, why is God doing this to me or why, you know, it's, it's like, it's all part of the plan, you know, somehow there's a, there's a plan for how this is going to work out better. Not that I don't think God brings us. I, I really don't want to believe that God brings us cancer or anything horrible, um, not equating you know, me being gay as cancer, but, you know, just diversity and mm -hmm. disorder. But um, I do believe that all good can come from many things and that it that God works through everything, no matter how our earth experience brings it up. God uses everything. And mm -hmm. um, it made me think, too, I just had a conversation with a, a really good friend of mine who uh, is right now transitioning to be his, you know, his authentic self and he went for a surgery and they said we can't do the surgery right now and he said well why and i mean they had done all these tests but they never realized that the ovaries that they were seeing were actually his testicles that had fused to his prostate somehow and you know of course never dropped identified female at birth or, you know, and, and so they had to, they had to take off the, the testicles because they were, you know, causing a problem at this point. And then he, he said, so, you know, back in the day when I was a teenager, my parents were concerned that I was having more testosterone than anybody else than a girl should have. And I started looking a little masculine. So they started doing estrogen therapy on him as a young teen and later as as people started tracking his records back in order to prepare for this transition surgery the doctor showed him the other day that his estrogen level back when he was a teenager when they started the, the his testosterone level when he was back as a teenager was higher than what he's taking now in order to help him fully transition once being on all this estrogen Mm. And that he was always biologically male, misidentified mm -hmm. gender at birth. And this whole time he knew he was male. And that's what the trans community goes through when they're trying to line up with their authentic self. It may not always be the actual um, you know, testicles that would prove it, but that there is there is a biological reason why they feel misgendered yeah. and why they really are misgendered. And for him, it was just very dramatic to find the testicles hanging out in there. And then he had to have a prostate exam, which he's like, really <laughs> of all the things you took out, you, you, you could have left the testicles, take out the prostate. <laughs> you know, you know, he's just like, right. I don't really need that. <laughs> yeah. But it's yeah. an amazing so affirmation that we don't know how people feel on the inside of their body. We don't know what's going on for anybody else. And the judgment to think that they aren't doing something that's right for them. Um, and that's authentic for them is, is, you know, a little high and mighty from us sometimes. Yeah. It reminds me. So, um, you know, that we don't really use in the Catholic church, we don't really use clobber verses, you know, because, um, we take the historical critical approach to scripture, right? You know, right? Uh, although some people do use the clobber verses, but probably if there was a clobber theology, it would be theology of the body, which is a series of of um, teachings that have been, you know, on, on John Paul by John Paul II, which is basically image doctrine, right? You know, or Romans one twenty that um, God's invisible attributes of power and divinity can be perceived in the things which God has made. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we get fundamentalist oftentimes with theology of the body or with image doctrine, because we just affirm that the reflection is what's typical in nature and we ignore variation in nature. Well, there's the theology. There is good theology when we look at what's, you know, typical, mm -hmm. but then there's also theology behind what's not typical, you know, mm -hmm. what is variation. And what is God saying to us through those individuals and through who they are? You know, when I, when I look at my children's gender identity, I'm reminded that God is neither exclusively male or female. Mm -hmm. And when I think about their sexual orientation, I'm reminded that there's no limit to who God loves. You know, mm -hmm. so those are, those are aspects there. Um, 
And I think that God brings in variation also to stretch us mm -hmm. to get out of our, 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 our side is right. Your side is wrong and broaden us into saying, we don't know everything mm -hmm. and, and into a deeper path of love, you know? Absolutely. I've always said until you can tell me definitively who made God, don't be telling me that, that we know everything. Yeah. <laughs> Because, because I asked my my fundamentalist grandfather when I was like four and a half, five years old, who made God? And he sent me to bed. He didn't he didn't want to answer that question because he, nobody can answer that question, you know, right. and until mm -hmm. you can answer that question, don't tell me that that what God is still doing in the world and how God is still speaking to us is not relevant mm -hmm. and that everything variation every difference that we come diversity that we come up with i think that is god still working to sit how compassionate can you be how are you ever going to learn to be compassionate if you only like the people that you're like you know mm -hmm. love the people that i created no matter how they show up in the world love them mm -hmm. you know and i think that that all the diversity in the world is part of that that we have mm -hmm. to stretch. We have to be able to say God's love is bigger than my unknowing. Yeah. And then the foundation of the Christian understanding of God as agape, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that specific word of love in the Greek, mm -hmm. loving the other as other and being made in that image and likeness. We're called, we're mm -hmm. called to that as well. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, th I think that's part of the lesson of, of the journey. And it's a journey that you've taken and, and so many lives are going to be blessed with that. I mean, they're going to be able to find some, some solace in the words that you give. And, and I hope that, you know, the parents will really open their hearts and their minds and their ears as you speak to them and let them then be able to give that gift of authenticity to their, to their kids. Mm. Well, thank you. Appreciate mm. that. Yeah, we've, we've gotten some good things happening. Um, it's, we started a, uh, we have a parish in Nashville where we have an inclusive LGBTQ spirituality group, you mm. know, meeting once a month. And so I got that rolling. It's called Always God's Children. Oh, um, nice. So, yeah, I've just been really, um, man, I, I haven't done anything in terms of, of mission um, that I've, I've felt like, I don't know was so guided before, mm -hmm. you know, then, then this part of, of, um, my journey, our journey, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, walking mm -hmm. with people. Yeah. Well, it was, it was very awesome that we met at wild goose because I, I definitely wanted your story to be heard and I wanted you to have a place to say it and a place that we could put it out into the universe. <laughs> Because it's important, you know, and, and it's important that other people hear what you're doing, that they might replicate that, you know, in their parishes and in their communities. Because um, even in Asheboro, I mean, we, I was talking to somebody the other day at, you know, the parish that I belong to at the Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd is is one of maybe two par churches, parishes that are affirming. And really affirming, not just we welcome you so we can pray behind your back, but that we love you and we believe that you're God's children and that you're mm -hmm. you know not going to hell. And the other church is actually going through the Methodist split. So, you know, one of the churches is right. completely non-affirming. This one is affirming, but there's like this tension, you know, going through right now as to whether or not everybody will stay. But the you know minister is absolutely devoted to our community and wants to be that church and is choosing to be that church for, for this community. So, you know, it's, it's so hard, especially as you spoke about the rural community for, for kids and, and adults to find a place to go that is affirming and not just, you know, fake about it because mm -hmm. <laughs> some say they are, but they're not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that at least in, in Nashville that you've got something going on and that, that people can come and, and be accepted. And the, you know, when you talk about the rural community, there've been some, some pretty big strides in Tennessee. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some, uh, you know, used to be just Nashville 
had a pride mm-hmm. festival, mm-hmm. you know, um, in middle Tennessee and then, and then in Murfreesboro. And then now, um, Franklin, Tennessee had its second, which is really huge because it's pretty much the heart of American evangelicalism when it comes to the media yeah. and everything and publishing the music industry, all of that stuff is, you know, headquartered there. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's a big deal. And then, you know, Pulaski, Tennessee as well, uh, which gosh, is where the KKK started, you know, I mean, <laughs> wow. you know, so we were, you know, pretty far south and in, in um, middle Tennessee. So um, they are dealing with a lot of, a lot more political pushback, you know, um, and especially in Murray County, there's been quite a bit of, of, of stuff happening with the libraries and, mm. you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, as, as we come to the end of this time together, which I always hate to end <laughs> great conversations, but um, is there anything else on your heart that we haven't covered that you think is relevant and you really want to make sure that you're able to say? Well, I guess I would say um, to parents, you know, uh, the first reaction of a, of a Christian parent when their kid comes out is, is this our fault? Mm. And it's, it's not your fault. It's just the love of God work in a new way in your family mm. and with mm. your kids. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. And you found that for yourself, didn't you? Yeah. 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 I'm so grateful for you, Greg. I'm grateful for the light that you're putting in the world and the, the love that you gave to your kids and the, and the choices you made to make sure that your kids didn't become a statistic. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'm just so, so delighted that I chose to go to the very hot, hot, hot <laughs> place, <laughs> Wild Goose Festival in July. We actually had a reprieve. It wasn't as bad as it's been in the past, I heard. But oh, well. I don't know. My goodness sakes, then. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty hot. But anyway, um, but I joke about that only to say that um, the Wild Goose Festival, even as hot as it was, the love there keeps me coming back. So, <laughs> you know, I feel so loved there. And the pride flags are, are flying in abundance at the Wild Goose Festival, even though it's not it, it is not just exclusively an LGBTQIA community, but there's a lot of us there and we are affirmed and loved. So, um, and I got to meet you, so it made it all worth it to endure the heat. <laughs> I was really grateful. You know, it's interesting because how, how that happened too, I got to the festival was very last minute kind of thing. Oh. Um, I was at the outreach um, dot faith conference, which it was um, actually, it, it was a, a Catholic LGBTQ ministry conference in New York city. And I, I ran into uh, Terry and, uh-huh. and Krista, you know, because uh-huh. they were there and they're involved in, in on the ministry level. And then they're also organizing the music for the festival. Mm-hmm. And I, I happened to lead one of my my psalms that I composed for part of the for one of the prayer services. And so we got to talking and they invited me out there, you know. So when mm-hmm. I talk about this journey of just feeling it's very spirit led, uh-huh. you know. Yeah. And that whole idea of going where love leads, it's it's definitely been leading me. It's been a beautiful thing. That is a beautiful thing. Yes. So I'm glad that happened. And serendipity or God leading, however you want to say it. I mean, I, I do believe that there are no coincidences and we were definitely destined to meet. So I'm glad that that happened. So thank you again. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Mitch. And I want to thank my listeners for coming back each week, supporting, sharing, and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to see more information and links to connect with Greg, go to the Gay With God show page at empoweredmidge.podbean.com. There's going to be a wealth of information that you're going to be able to find on Greg, and you're going to want to see all of it. So if you are listening to this podcast and you're questioning whether you can be gay and be in a relationship with the God of your understanding, If you identify as LGBTQIA+, or maybe you're not even sure yet if you are gay, God has always been within you, even when you didn't know it. You have always been gay with God. 
Check out our Facebook group, Gay With God, where we do a monthly Zoom group entitled My Faith Journey. If you need support to help your coming out process or your faith journey, go to the show page at empoweredmidge.podbean.com. Scroll all the way down to the bottom and see how you can connect with me. So thank you, everybody. Stay tuned to see how you can join the Gay With God community. And I love you. See you next week. I want to invite you to become a part of the Gay With God community. How can you do that? Stay connected by messaging me your thoughts and comments in the comment section under the downloads of the show on the Gay With God show page. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen and share, share, share so we can increase our community outreach and be a light to those who are struggling to claim their faith. Consider being a sponsor so I can highlight your service in our community. We are all worthy of respect and a relationship with the God of our understanding. I want to thank you in advance for supporting this podcast. Together, we as a community will keep this show visible and our community stronger. Deep gratitude to my friend Tim McClendon of Tim McClendon Music for allowing me to use an excerpt from Interlude 4, a song found on his CD entitled Sundance.